Um, welcome everyone to, to this event um, on, on women climate entrepreneurs. And we're really pleased that, that you could join us today. Um, we have here with us six amazing women who are going to speak to this topic. So we will be, I will give you a short introduction of each of these six. Um, but in the it, beginning, I want to just talk a little bit about um, the protocol here. So by now, everybody's been on Zoom calls, I think, for the last year and a half. But um, we will be accepting each each presenter will have about eight minutes to present. Please, if you have any clarifying questions for the presenters, raise your hand and you can do that by going to the reactions um, at the bottom of, this, of this, your screen. If you have other questions, please keep them in the chat session. Um, we will be monitoring those and we hope to have a full half hour at the end for discussion and for um, to answer questions you put in the chat. Um, I would also encourage everybody to introduce yourself in the chat. Please just give us um, a notion of who you are, where you're calling in from, and you know what, what your interest is perhaps in this topic. Um, and with no further ado, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of introduction to these, as I said, incredible women. I'll start with, I'll go in the order of the presenting, uh, the presentations. First, we have Maria, Maria Lena, who is the W plus coordinator. And Maria Lena is amazing. Uh, breadth of experience as a gender consultant. She works with UNEP, EIB, e ERBD, um, EPDR, e European Bank for Rural <laughs> Development, uh, the 2X Challenge, um, and many others. So we're always really thrilled to have her. Um, Katie is uh, a consultant and particularly doing some fascinating research on women-led businesses in the climate sectors. Um, You'll be very interested to hear the findings of her research. Hannah is someone I've recently come to know who is an amazing woman who is the CEO of ERA and implementing a Red Plus forestry project in Brazil. I'm, I think she has an amazing, I know I'm using the word amazing a lot, but um, Hannah grew up with, as she will tell me, um, talking about carbon trading and carbon markets over her kitchen table as a, as a young child. How many women can say that? Sue is the founder of Gender Tech, and I'm very pleased to say she's a new WOCON board member. She's now an advisor on gender to the task force to scale voluntary carbon markets, which she'll talk about here. Rachel is also uh, a, an old colleague of mine um, who's a member of the W Plus Advisory Council, who has worked with a large project developer, Wildlife Works, uh, also a Red Plus uh, project developer in Trading Carbon Credits, who's now launching her own brokerage, and she'll tell us more about that. Chintal is an advisor to the 2X Climate Finance Task Force and the Rallying Cry, uh, which raises the voices of women, agribusinesses tackling climate change and connecting them to investors. So we've brought all of these women together to hear and have them share their experiences as women entrepreneurs in climate sectors, uh, to focus on the role that women do and can play in climate solutions. This is also moving away from the often heard narrative in the climate world about women as victims, as vulnerable, not to say that women are not vulnerable to climate change, um, climate changes, but these women are forging new pathways in the climate space, particularly in the carbon markets um, that is not yet much recognized and appreciated. Um, we believe that these women can show how initiatives at the nexus of gender and climate can be supported and scaled up. So with no further ado, um, I will hand this back to Maria Elena, who will be the first uh, presenter. Can you share the slideshow, Maria Elena? Sure, thank you very much, Jeanette. And let me check. Okay, um, thank you for, for this introduction and a good uh, afternoon uh, to colleagues. Uh, very thrilled to be here with you today and very excited to hear all these experiences by amazing colleagues uh, working on the nexus of gender and climate. Um, 
basically, I would like to say a few words about the W plus standard for those who are not familiar with it. Um, so this is a certification framework used for projects that create social and economic uh, benefits for women. Um, and it measures, quantifies and monetizes social impact created for women. Um, so in, in our work um, with Jeanette, um, what we were also interested in and what led us to undertake a survey in April, June 2021, earlier this year, um, was the little study group of women entrepreneurs uh, in climate space, um, developers, brokers, investors, um, and auditors. Um, and what we really wanted to understand were the various roles women have in the environmental uh, markets ecosystem. And basically by understanding this group better and their functions, how we can leverage this and scale up impact climate and gender quality results. So we had multiple objectives under this um, survey. Uh, first to look at the different roles and then also to identify projects that are already generating carbon credits and that benefit women or are led by, by women but are not yet measuring um, this impact. Uh, but also projects that do not yet generate carbon credits or W plus credits, but could have the potential to do so. Um, so the survey uh, was um, filled out by 23 individuals, um, as I mentioned before, women who work in this space. Um, and we received very interesting results. Um, Basically, we saw that nearly all respondents are somehow engaged in projects that benefit both women and the environment. Um, and what all brokers and sellers of carbon and environmental units um, saw an interest from buyers in supporting projects that provide benefits to women. So we have a very positive outlook here. Uh, most of the respondents also said that there is an inadequate supply of credits from projects that benefit women and that there is also a lack of awareness um, around that. So this clearly points us to a gap um, and it's also about us understanding how we can increase uh, awareness about this potential of generating credits that um, that are women empowerment credits. Um, quite a few of the respondents, 59%, believe that the demand for carbon credits with women empowerment benefits will grow once buyers are aware of the opportunity to purchase offsets with women empowerment co-benefits. So again, this points us to the increasing awareness um, imperative in this space. Um, and also the majority of respondents believe that buyers are willing to pay a premium price for carbon or environmental credits that also have um, women empowerment co-benefits. However, efforts still need to be made to meet this demand, um, as most of the respondents are not aware of any women-led or own carbon projects that also benefit women. Um, we also asked the question about um, which um, domains um, would um, buyers be most interested in um, when it comes to women empowerment uh, benefits. Uh, so, you know that the W plus standards measures benefits to women across six domains that are shown um, in this wheel on the right, time savings, income and assets, knowledge and education, health, food security and leadership. Um, and in fact, income and assets areas and knowledge and education seem to top the list 
in terms of W plus credits that buyers would be most interested in. Um, we also aimed to gain a better understanding of women who work in environmental markets um, and most of them had more than five years of experience. So we came across women who, who are quite experienced in this space. Um, and half of the respondents said that they don't have any obstacles as women in the carbon market ecosystem. Um, however, 22% responded that they face certain difficulties working as women in this field. And those included a glass ceiling and career advancement. Um, their, their credibility quite often being questioned by clients and colleagues, and also not having access to all information um, from clients. Um, also, 75% uh, of the respondents observed that the number of women engaged in the, in the environmental market ecosystem has increased since their beginnings, which is a very uh, positive um, observation. Um, and certainly uh, what we were thrilled to see is that almost all women respondents expressed their interest to join a network on the nexus of gender and climate um, when it comes to, to voluntary carbon markets. Um, as a result, um, we also wanted to share a few recommendations based on the findings of this research. Um, what came out very strongly was the need to conduct uh, further research among workers in the environmental markets ecosystem to identify gender related challenges um, in their jobs. Um, and then this also pointed to a need to form a network of women so that we have opportunities such as this one today um, for its members to share experiences, perspectives and solutions about how we can bring about changes uh, in the environmental markets ecosystem. Um, also, how to promote gender equality, uh, and this can be done in many different ways. Here, we have included a few ideas, such as the introduction of quotas to achieve parity among workers um, in the workspace, uh, but also quotas or at least some kind of targets uh, for choosing environmental projects that also um, benefit women. And then, of course, a lot of capacity building and training of carbon brokers and project developers alike, so that they can be more aware about the links between gender and climate actions and why they can choose projects that, alongside carbon offsets, they generate co benefits um, um, for women's empowerment. And then finally, this lack of awareness that exists about the opportunity to look at climate action that also um, promotes gender equality to improve transparency by informing and clarifying how women can be positively impacted uh, by carbon emissions projects. Um, and also demonstrating why buyers should be purchasing carbon offsets with co-benefits um, for women. Um, and I can stop here. And yes, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Maria Elena. To the interest uh, of time, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any, any requests or any questions at this time. So we will keep moving through uh, all of the presenters and do please think about points for discussion and, and questions at the end. Um, next, we would like to introduce Katie Turner. Next slide, Maria Elena, if you can. Thanks, Jeanette. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Really nice to be here with you. And thanks so much to Jeanette and Wilkin for organizing this, this webinar. Um, as noted, I'm, a, I'm an independent consultant uh, working in a variety of areas, including ecosystem development and, and gender lens investing, including the nexus of gender and climate. 
And I think the most relevant piece of my experience for this webinar today is um, some support I'm providing to a program called Accelerating Women Climate Entrepreneurs, which as you can see is a $2.1 million initiative um, that's focused on addressing barriers and opportunities for women climate entrepreneurs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's funded by Global Affairs Canada and led by the Aga Khan Foundation in um, partnership with WUSC and Andy, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with some or all of those organizations. And it just launched in April of this year. So it'll go for two years. Um, and there's a big research component that I'm heavily involved in and I'll, I'll get into in a second. But um, I guess before doing that, wanted to highlight that the way we're defining woman climate entrepreneur in this program is a woman entrepreneur who promotes green growth either directly. So it could be a, a, a business owner who's selling solar panels, uh, it could be indirectly. So a, a business that is using renewable energy to power their operations, or it could be through a supporting role such as consultants who are providing uh, training related to climate change. So there's, there's those three different ways. Um, and also that it's aligned with the SGB term. So the small and growing business definition of a, a business owner that in that they have between five and 250 employees and are seeking growth capital between 20,000 and $2 million. Um, and of course, the reason why we're focusing on women climate entrepreneurs, of course, everyone is aware that women are just disproportionately impacted by climate change, but also that they are um, they have a primary role in, in addressing these impacts of climate change due to their role as being um, users and managers of natural resources, their leaders and innovators in coming up with climate solutions, um, and the potential to create really positive impact related to uh, climate smart jobs and products. And, you know, through the research, we, we definitely did see that there's there's been more um, increasing uh, attention to this nexus of climate and gender um, through allocations of capital, as well as the development of different um, initiatives by ecosystems players like uh, Gender Smarts Gender and Climate Investment Working Group, the 2X Gender and Climate Task Force, um, and a, a host of others that are some of, many of whom are, are actually in this uh, call today. But of course, there's still lots and lots of work to be done. And I think that the timing of this webinar is really key right before COP and hopefully this will stimulate some good discussion um, and you know, action at, at COP. Um, so the next slide basically is a summary of some of our research to date. So we could go to the next slide. Um, and I just wanted to share with you the, the, some of the key recommendations that we've, that we've um, found. And, and just to be clear, the, the recommendations here are um, specifically targeting incubators and accelerators that are working in the space already or who are looking to, to expand support to women climate entrepreneurs. Um, but as you can see, of course, incubators and accelerators are part of a wider ecosystem. They don't operate in silos. And so there's a, there's a whole host of other actors um, who are involved in supporting women climate entrepreneurs um, incubators and accelerators, of course, but other stakeholders such as DFIs, other investors, um, financial services providers, um, NGOs. So there's a whole host of system stakeholders who we interviewed um, over the past couple of months to, to come together and develop these recommendations, these four recommendations. And this is just a taste of what is a, a knowledge product that it will actually be releasing in the next uh, three or four weeks. So hopefully we can push that that product out to this audience and would you know look forward to any any input or feedback you have on that because our research will be continuing over the next year and actually um, will form some strategy strategy recommendations to the government of Canada in their gender responsive climate strategy. So I'll just dive in. Um, the first one that we found was related to capacity building, capacity building for both gender and climate. Um, what we really found was that incubators and accelerators lack the technical expertise to really provide women climate entrepreneurs with climate specific capacity related to renewable energy, waste management, water management, as well as advisors who have expertise on things like green packaging and marketing of green products. Um, and so there's really a need to expand the internal capacity there by um, working with uh, collaborating with organizations such as the, the Private Network for Advisory Finance, PFAN, 
Um, and they, there are many of you are probably familiar with them. They, they have, it's a global network of climate advisors that work with incubators and accelerators and, and businesses. Um, so there's opportunity to, to collaborate with existing networks to leverage their, their um, expertise. Um, partnering with universities who have capacity in this area and are looking to, to channel that capacity in a very practical way to, to businesses. And of course, keeping in mind that um, there, of all of the climate advisors that exist out there who support SMEs or SGBs, there's a lack of women climate advisors. And, and WCEs um, generally prefer to, to, be, uh, to receive advisory services from women climate advisors. So just keeping that in mind that there's a, then a need to increase that um, in that area. And then if we go to the gender side, um, equally there's, although I think um, many incubators and accelerators are a bit more advanced in this area in terms of their gender capacity, there's still, um, according to WCEs, a real need to ensure that the um, accelerator programs out there are really thinking through how they're designing their programs to meet the needs of women entrepreneurs, women climate entrepreneurs. So really going through that process of thinking through um, first, things like who is on the advisory board or the selection committee? Is it a gender diverse group who is who is selecting um, the 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 uh, business owners that are eligible for these programs? Um, who are the advisors? Are they men and women? Um, are there services available to to women climate entrepreneurs to help them to to uh, balance uh, family commitments that they might have, childcare facilities, that kind of thing? So really thinking through how the programs are, are designed to meet the needs of women. Um, and then of course, um, there's also the need to collect gender disaggregated data on these, for these programs to really make sure that, you know, as these programs are rolled out, there's ongoing data collection um, to understand how men and women are, are um, perceiving the programs and then making changes based on that. So, you know, I would say, Gender, the development of gender indicators and gender uh, data, collection of gender data is fairly low hanging fruit, but it's something that needs to be done really intentionally to make sure that those perspectives are captured. And there's a lot of different toolkits out there that can help with that, um, many of which are featured in the knowledge product. Um, the second recommendation is mentoring. So we definitely, this came through very clearly from women climate entrepreneurs that it's a male, it's a male dominated space. There's very few successful women entrepreneurs out there in the climate space that can really serve as role models to these women. Um, lack of confidence is a real issue with, you know, many women not even realizing that their business is a climate business, um, just because especially in sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very nascent um, field and, you know, not a lot is known about, about climate finance, about climate change, um, the climate change entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, Women are really looking for mentors, female mentors who can serve as role models to them and can help boost their confidence, can connect them with others in the space, can um, help with networking, which is so critical in, in accessing finance. So I, I think there's, there's a few different things that can be done. Um, and I think one of them, sort of low hanging fruit, is just to share um, information to promote existing female entrepreneurs in the climate space. Um, through a variety of networks. It could be, you know, it could be simple as blogs. It could be through um, organizations like, like PFAN um, who have wide exposure globally and really to promote um, the success stories as well as the learnings of, of women climate entrepreneurs so that there's more, um, there's more known about the, the, the successes that these businesses are having. Um, and an example is actually related to PFAN. They're, they're, um, they're actually going through the development of a gender strategy, which is really exciting. And part of that is a partnership with the African Women in Energy Development Group, um, who have you know, made up of, of women in the energy space. And PFAN is really looking to pull from, from that network um, in order to, to identify women mentors who can really serve as role models in that space. Um, financial models was the third recommendation, and I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm close to my time, so I'm going to try and be, be quick, but financial models, I mean, really, uh, many of you are probably aware that accelerators and incubators do really struggle with uh, sustainability of, of, their, of their business models, um, largely because, you know, most don't use that, the Silicon Valley model where they're taking equity in the businesses that they support. 
So there's, you know, there's a there's often a shortage of, of funding, which would allow them to expand the types of services and support that they provide to the entrepreneurs. Um, so really what we what we found and recommend is that incubators and acceler accelerators really try to diversify their revenue sources and not just rely on grant funding, but rely on um, try and work with government funding sources and also try think about um, fee for service models. Uh, so there's a few few um, incubators and accelerators out there that are already doing that, and I think um, that's you know a really critical piece to to be aware of. And I mean also re regardless of the fact that you know you don't want to rely only on grant funding, it is incubators and accelerators in this space are getting a lot more attention, and I think are being recognized uh, for the critical role that they play in supporting women entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general. So I think it is really important for these incubators and accelerators to be familiar with that grant market so that they understand, you know, where are the grants coming from? How do you how do you develop a good proposal? How do you respond to, to the, what the donor is looking for? Um, so that's a whole sort of separate skill set that needs to be developed. And then lastly is partner engagement. So as I mentioned earlier, I mean, these incubators and accelerators, they don't operate in silos and there's a real need to partner with other ecosystem actors. Um, for example, financial um, institutions, a lot of the women climate entrepreneurs we spoke with said that, you know, the accelerator programs are great, but um, one thing they don't do very well is to partner with financial institutions who can connect them with sources of financing. So very often these um, women climate entrepreneurs are bouncing from, from accelerator to accelerator program and not being able to go to that next level um, because they're just, they don't have the connections and they don't have the access to finance. Uh, there's lots of other partners that you can, that they can work with universities, government, crowdsourcing platform. So, um, and again, a lot more information provided in the, in the knowledge product. So I could I could talk for for a long time, but I think I'll I'll leave it at there. And hopefully these um, these recommendations are are helpful and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Katie. My goodness, so much. Um, I'd love to hear you talk for hours. Um, perhaps we can arrange another time for that. But I, I hope everybody did at least hear your plea for feedback to the study. Um, can you give us any indication of when that final study would come out and be available for to provide feedback on? It'll be it'll be out in the next three or four weeks, and there actually will be a webinar as well. So um, I'll work with Jeanette to make sure that everyone on this list is is gets notice of that, and um, and as well as the webinar. Fantastic! Thank you so much. And so and for those extremely concrete ideas of of what we can do next. Okay, Maria Lena, can you pull up the next set of slides? Okay, I. I think this is um, Hannah's slide from Brazil, but Hannah, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, <laughs> Jeanette. Um, it's a real honor to be with you all here today uh, and share my story of how I founded Era Brazil. And I hope my story inspires you all to, you know, go out and start your own business as well. So. I'd like to start with showing you a photo here. Uh, this photo is from the Cerrado biome. And the Cerrado biome is Brazil's second largest biome after the Amazon. And it's also a biodiversity hotspot. So it's one of Brazil's, uh, it's actually one of the world's most biodiverse savanna and grassland. And the Cerrado biome is severely threatened due to the expanding uh, commercial agriculture. Uh, it's heavily destroyed half of the biome already. So you have massive fields of soy and pasture, and there's little work being done on conserving this biome. So um, for those of you who don't know, the Cerrado biome is also the headwaters of important waterways that go into the Amazon. So obviously the impacts of deforestation on this biome um, are you know, very severe on the biodiversity, the water supply, the water quality, and it, has, it could have global impact. So the strato biome is, is, uh, is, is close to my heart, let's just say. And before I share on how ERA is planning or how ERA is actively supporting the conservation of this biome, I'd like to share my journey of how a Canadian <laughs> ended up in the Cerrado biome. So I grew up on Can in Vancouver, Canada, and growing up on the west coast of Canada, uh, my love for 
nature started as a child, right? So my parents uh, brought us into nature. We went snowboarding where I was in the ocean. So I always felt this need to protect and serve Gaia. And as Jeanette mentioned, my father is, uh, he works in the carbon markets as well. So <laughs> at the dinner table, it was always carbon markets and climate change and, you know, ISO standards and VCS. So uh, since, since I was young, I, I learned about sort of the intricacies of the carbon markets um, and the architecture of it and how to develop carbon projects. So I was able to see my dad, who also is an entrepreneur, um, build his business and conserve and do one of the first projects actually in the DRC. Um, so that was exciting. So obviously I followed his footsteps <laughs> and I went to school um, and did my undergraduate degree at McGill. Uh, in Montreal, I studied environmental sciences with a focus on environmental markets. And I also played on a, a, a varsity soccer team. And that was an important moment because I think when you play at that level of uh, soccer, you push yourself and you learn all about perseverance, <laughs> discipline and leadership, which are key skills that you need as a woman entrepreneur. Um, so after my studies, I got a job working in Calgary uh, for the uh, under the Alberta carbon market, which was very nice because it was at that time it was one of Canada's first carbon markets. So I really got a lot of experience firsthand at developing methodologies, uh, writing PDDs, uh, working on models, and working in in a collaborative effort with government, uh, you know, industry and, and NGOs. But yeah, you know, after three years of those really tough, cold winters, <laughs> I said, I can't handle it anymore. Vancouver doesn't have uh, such bad winters as Calgary. So I said, you know what, I'm done. I, I quit the job. I, I, I sold all my stuff. And I was like, I'm going south. So that journey took me through South America. And my last stop on my trip was Brazil. And I really fell in love with the people, the culture, uh, the music, just the energy that Brazil has uh, was, was really captivating. And I decided that I was gonna live here. <laughs> so I needed a way to make money here. So I looked at my skills and I looked at, uh, you know, the opportunities in Brazil. And if you look at Brazil's emissions profile, the biggest emissions are from land use and deforestation. So um, I, I decided to, you know, dig into that. So I called up my dad and I said, hey, do you know anyone in Brazil? And he's like, yeah, I know this guy. So I called him up um, and he was like, why don't you join me in this meeting up in Tocantins? And Tocantins is a state in the middle of Brazil um, in the Cerrado biome. So I flew up and at this point, my Portuguese was, you know, not good at all. <laughs> so. You can imagine this Canadian girl sitting at a table of like 30 people from, from the government. Uh, the meeting's happening in Portuguese and I'm like struggling to follow along, totally out of my comfort zone. Um, <laughs> but you know, one thing leads to another. And I think when you trust your intuition and follow your heart, the opportunities unfold and, and appear for you. So that meeting led to the development of a feasibility study where I dove into the drivers of deforestation in the Cerrado, was able to go to lots of conferences, was able to travel around the Cerrado, meet different people, talk to people, and basically was the, the sort of uh, melting pot for, for ERA. So ERA was born in 2018. And at the beginning, it was basically just me acting as a independent consultant, doing little projects here and there, trying to, trying to make it work. Um, but then in 2020, um, I won a grant uh, from the Swiss Re Foundation for Climate Resilience. And it was the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and I came second place. And uh, that gave me 200,000 US to really start looking at project development. Uh, because it was my dream and, you know, I saw the opportunity right there in front of me to develop carbon conservation projects in the Cerrado because of all of this pressure, right, from the commercial agriculture. 
So ERA was born, uh, a new chapter of ERA was born in 2020 uh, when I started my first uh, carbon conservation red project uh, to the VCS standard. And now we're literally two years later, I'm just finishing the audit. So hopefully by the end of the year, we will be able to sell uh, about 400,000 tons. This is the, these are the first credits from conservation in the Cerrado, and I'm very happy. Um, oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> Forgot I got slides here. Um, so yeah, basically the, uh, the mission of ERA is to you know conserve the remaining native grasslands of the Cerrado biome, and we do this using the carbon market. So I think as women, we have this you know, nascent ability uh, to nurture and to collaborate, unlike men. Uh, no offense to all the guys out there on this call, but, you know, women have this innate ability to build bridges, I think. And what ERA is doing is building a bridge between the landholders né, who are, uh, you know, needing carbon finance to preserve their surplus forests, and then the carbon buyers on the other side who are looking for good projects with impact you know, um, to meet their emission reductions goals. So I think the world needs more bridges because I went to a COP um, a couple of years ago and, you know, you hear, you know, we got all this money, but we're just lacking good projects. And then I, I here living in Brazil, seeing all these beautiful grassroots projects, like scraping by doing grant after grant. And they're like, where's the money? So there's this lack of um, connectivity between money and projects. And I really think the carbon markets are a tool to leverage um, this money that's there and, and direct it towards impact. So I'm a big fan of the carbon markets as a tool uh, to transition towards this sort of next greener economy. Um, so I, I think it has a big important role to play. And so, yeah, next slide, I I'm, I'm think I'm wrapping up here. Excellent. So here you have uh, um, some of the co-benefits, right? Because every red project, um, usually if you want to sell the credits for more, you sell a plus. So the W plus standard allows you to quantify impacts to women's empowerment. Uh, there's CCD, there's social carbon. So there's a number of um, these co-benefit methodologies that project developers like ERA use uh, to really monitor the impacts of co-benefits and also monetize. Um, so we are, you know, we have a number of indicators, 18 indicators that, you're, that we're looking at. And I think carbon finance is a really good tool to take this revenue that, that is generated from carbon projects and drive it to you know, smallholders uh, to do regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. As you can see here, there's a picture of Sueli, who's a uh, regenerative farmer in Tocantins. Um, there's Baru nuts there, which is a beautiful nut from the Cerrado. Uh, yeah, and like I said, the Cerrado is a biodiversity hotspot. So really, um, ERA is protecting the surplus native, native vegetation on private properties. Uh, it's technically an avoided planned conversion project. And uh, we have our first, uh, we have 10,000 hectares uh, in the program now, but we've developed the program as a group structure. So we are actively looking for additional landholders so that we can scale the program. And this year was a big year because ERA secured half a million dollars from an investor, uh, Carbon Streaming. And they are supporting, you know, the scaling of our team uh, so that we can, you know, do more impact in the strato and, and scale the program. So, yeah, it, a couple words of closing to, you know, the other women on this call or, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs is put everything on paper. <laughs> I had a number of experiences where when things aren't clear and on paper, uh, it can get really muddy and messy. Uh, so put everything on paper and have a really good support network because being an entrepreneur is not easy. There are moments where you're crying and you want to give up and everything's horrible and the world's going to end. But then you have those people around you to support you uh, and good mentors to help support you on hard decisions. 
uh, it makes a really big difference. And yeah, that's, you know, be confident, value yourself. I think women need to stand up for ourselves so much uh, in, this, in, in this industry. And uh, a lot of the times men can sort of take it over and especially in big organizations. Yesterday I had a meeting with a large, um, one of the largest food uh, commodities buyers in, in Brazil, actually in the world. And there were the two girls on the sustainability team and then the four guys on the like ag sourcing and like the commodity sourcing. And then the women were like, yeah, this program's so good. Look how it can help, you know, you know, save the, the surplus forest. And the guys are just like, you know, there's no, the, the productivity is just going up in Brazil. We don't have any, you know, climate change problems here. And then it's just like, you just gotta breathe and, you know, hopefully we gotta be the change that the world wants to see and they will follow along as we, we, make, we make the change happen. So yeah, that's sort of my story. Um, it was all about going outside my comfort zone, taking risks. And yeah, I hope my story inspires you all to <laughs> be entrepreneurs. But I think, you know, everyone on this call are, are amazing entrepreneurs. So this is, this is exciting. The future, the future is feminine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. You can all see why I was so delighted to encounter Hannah and meet with her. Well, gosh, it was just about a month month ago. Um, beautiful example of a woman leader taking a risk, um, getting out there and, and doing what she knows is right. So thank you, Hannah. Um, wish we had so much more time to hear it, but thank you for sharing your very personal story. It's, uh, it's a rare opportunity for us to hear from somebody like you who's actually doing it on the ground. So thanks. Um, next, we're gonna move to Sue. Maria Elena, can you move, advance the slide? Thank you. Uh -huh. Sue, the floor is yours. Hi, yeah. Um, thanks, Jeanette and everyone else on the panel. I mean, I'm just listening so hard, enjoying it. I thought, oh God, now I've got to focus on what I what I have to say. And uh, But the first thing, just message to Hannah, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to the woman who grew up learning about carbon credits because I'm someone who's very recently come to this space after you know, a career working in international development in the in the gender space. Again, my own entrepreneur. I set up a, and I ran a, a small consultancy company um, focused on gender equality for 21 years until last year. So I totally empathize with your experiences they sound very familiar um but it's just a time focusing on why Jeanette has asked me to to join the panel today and that's just to talk uh, a little bit about the work I'm doing um with the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets um just briefly for those who haven't come across this initiative it was um set up in 2020, uh, led, I think, by the Mark Carney, who's the UN envoy on climate finance. Um, and it was it's a private sector-led initiative that emerged out of, a, a, I guess, a response to the growing volume of, um, of the voluntary carbon market. And to give you a sense of figures that are Quote, often quoted, I think quoted by the task force themselves, I think the market at the moment or in 2020 was around $100 million um, dollars per annum. And they're talking about by 2030 to that increasing to, um, uh, yeah, $300 million per annum to $100 uh, billion per annum, which is just phenomenal growth, obviously, in, in scale. Um, big part, focus of the task force is really on its mission is to enable market standardization um, around high trading standards um, backed by strong strong governance and to cut a long story short the, the I got involved in the consultation group I was subsequently asked to get involved in the working group on core carbon principles and trying to to define what they what they are or should be um and then um after the uh release of the final report and the setting up of the new governance body i was asked to participate in the expert advisory group um to provide inputs on gender 
there. So, um, and that is something that I'm sort of, yeah, can, keen to continue to do. Why did I get involved um, in the first place? I said essentially for four main reasons. I think, I mean, as soon as I dipped my toe in the water of voluntary carbon markets, I was just genuinely surprised that the low level of consideration get given to gender and social considerations. Um, I found the work um, very sort of disconnected from the development sector and you know, good pockets of, you know, examples. And the, the, the Hannah's example just now is a wonderful example of the, the, you know, great work that's going on in this space, but it's very much pockets and certainly not sort of mainstreamed into the market operations. So that piqued my interest. And I guess, and particularly piqued my interest because of the whole volume, seeing this as a um, the scale of funding that are sort of moving uh, from the global north to global south at a time when traditional um, aid flows are, are dwindling, it seemed like a major sort of opportunity to, to look at the opportunities and uh, not as well as the, the impacts of this, of this uh, funding flow. Um, and I'm also someone, and I have another hat on, I'm on the board of Mama Cash, which many of you will know is a, is a women's fund. And so very, very aware of the acute, in fact, scandalous sort of shortage of resources, uh, financial resources and flows going to women's organizations. So I saw this as sort of like, okay, a lot of money, massive opportunity. How do we bring these two things together? And so I saw the, the, the task force as a strategic, um, opportunity. And if a task force is successful in, in, in setting a framework, if you like, for in upping the carbon markets game um, and establishing higher integrity in the market, then if one could try to influence and bring a stronger gender focus into, into that work, then that would, my personal theory of change if you like was that that would have its sort of ripple effects and 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 uh, influence operations across the ecosystem um and i guess the fourth the fourth point i just wanted to make about why i got involved goes back to the way in which i saw that gender and social impact was being considered was very much as from a point of view of impact uh, avoiding risk putting in safeguards doing no harm um, and one of the core carbon principles being looked at and is to do no net harm. And this is where th that, that, to me, that just should be an absolute rock bottom minimum um, that the task force should be aiming for. Um, but that it's it, the, the benefits, the co-benefits that can derive from the carbon market should be absolutely integral to um, carbon credits and not as an add-on as they are at the moment, but absolutely as an in integral sort of requirement. Um, so funding the sorts of things that, that we've just, the sort of project that, that Hannah just has taken, has, has talked to us about, talked about. Let's have a quick look at time here to see how I'm doing, because I do have a habit <laughs> talking too much. Um, so I guess, you know, that's a real sort of um, uh, a nutshell. Oh, Jeanette's telling me my time is up. OK. <laughs> I didn't think it was, but I'm quite happy for it uh, to be up and we can come back to questions and, and I can say more about perhaps the some of the achievements and where I see the big sort of opportunities uh, or areas to, to do work and to collaborate with others on doing work to really bring a stronger focus on gender into the into the carbon markets. Thanks. Th thank you, Sue. And exactly, there will be time for you hopefully to give uh, that kind of very concrete input as well. Thanks very much to talk about why this what were your motivations to enter into this very technical group? So um, next, with no further ado, we'll move on to Rachel. Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel, and thank you for the kind introduction earlier, Jeanette. Um, I'm a former investment banker and trader in my early 20s. I was in New York on a trading desk of all men. <laughs> and not to be boastful, but to put it into perspective as part of this conversation is around women and the misbalance between men and women 
in many industries, but in this one as well. Um, I was the highest grossing trader at my firm, which caused a lot of different reactions. And it also burned me out. And so I left that industry in 2009. Um, I went on to start my own company that I sold and I ended up, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Borneo rainforest, seeing the destruction uh, for palm oil production firsthand and decided to dedicate my life to protecting what remains of the natural world. Um, I luckily got picked up by Wildlife Works, a little known project developer. Hi Blaze, I'm so glad you're here. Um, in 2011, and I was assigned with selling <clears throat> the world's first Red Plus credits to a market that had no idea what Red Plus was. They thought it was Bono's uh, AIDS campaign. So <clears throat> we've come a long way since then. Um, I was proud to work for Wildlife Works for uh, just about six years and leading the charge and developing our relationships with all of our large corporate buyers across the US and some in Europe. Um, I, I took a moment to have a child and focus on that. He just turned two. And throughout that time, I stayed in touch with Jeanette. I was on the advisory council of the W plus for years. And about a year ago, I started to more formally um, step into a strategy role with Jeanette. Uh, I'm also involved in something called the Sacred Headwaters Initiative, which is focused on permanent protection of the sacred headwaters of the Amazon. So uh, Hannah, deeply appreciate what you're doing there and understand how challenging that work can be. Um, I am the founder of a company that is launching soon called Empower Co. This is not a slide that you're seeing. This is our, our landing site right now um, of the website. It's empowerco.com. You can put in your name and email address there to stay updated with us, but we are planning to launch in Q1 of next year. We will be initially a brokerage that is exclusively focused on the sale of W plus units. Woohoo! No one's done it yet. Let's get this going. So I am familiar with building new markets. <clears throat> I am familiar with introducing ideas and concepts that nobody knew existed. It is pushing a boulder up a hill, but I'm prepared to do it. I feel incredibly inspired to do it. And I am lucky to have the support of Jeanette, Mary Elena and others on this call who are committed to uh, seeing W plus come to scale in the market. So what does that mean? It means that like we did with Red Plus in 2011, <clears throat> we have to educate and create a lot of awareness in the market. So what I beg of everyone on this call is if you think W plus is a good idea, if you think measuring and monetizing women's empowerment, whether you're directly using it or not is a good idea, please share it. Please start to make people aware that this is a proven standard this is not something that Jeanette just pulled out of her back pocket. These are six robust methodologies for six domains of measurement of women's empowerment that have been developed over years and implemented in different projects around the world. So <clears throat> the more we can get the word out that this exists, make it known, the better. And PowerCo will be very focused on that. We will also be selling units. Um, initially, right now, we have a biogas project in Nepal that is uh, measured um, under the domain of time with the W plus standard, as well as a CSR livelihood project in Morocco that will be measuring, that has measured knowledge and education and income and assets under those two domains of the W plus standard. Those are the projects I can talk about now that we will be launching with available credits to the market. We also are working with several others um, who are planning or are in process of implementing the W plus standard both standalone projects where there'll just be W plus units coming out of them um, and uh, W plus labeled carbon. Um, the carbon is very exciting to me, obviously, because I come from that world. I know that there is a lot more to do in terms of social benefits specifically directed at women within red plus projects and others. And that those projects, because they have boots on the ground, at least the quality projects such as wildlife works and others, um, Hannah's project, because there are boots on the ground and there's already an infrastructure of um, understanding the community needs and also community relations happening, it's, it's a ripe and fertile ground to have W plus implemented and have more meaningful results for these projects and demand an even higher price point in the market, a premium for projects that do have W plus. So um, you can expect to see some projects coming out in the next six months, I'd say, a conservative estimate. 
that are initiating um, implementing the W plus standard within their uh, carbon project activities. That'll be incredibly exciting. Um, and just to speak to the demand side a little bit, I've worked with everyone from Microsoft to Coca-Cola to UPS to Audi to I've, I've, I've cold called all of them. I've gone and banged on their doors. I'm not afraid of these people. And what I have learned is that they almost all of them now uh, agree that climate change is important to address. Okay, so we've gotten that done. And the next step is the gender piece is, is definitely becoming a greater point of focus. And the issue is that with environment, at least where we are right now, there's, there's, a, there's a plethora of options for them to um, quantifiably have impact. And there's a bit of a one for one thing with carbon offsets, for example, but when it comes to gender, it's much more abstract. There hasn't been as much um, clarity on, on where do you put those dollars? How do you have meaningful impacts? How do you even measure what impact is? And I see the W plus as being a massive answer to that question that has, I think, millions of pent up, if not more dollars behind it. So it'll be a matter of going to those um, corporates uh, and intermediaries who have those close relationship with corporates and making sure that they know that this exists, which was to my earlier point. Um, but many studies have shown, and I'm happy to share this in a follow-up email, that the main priority of top 500, Fortune 500 companies who are involved in the SDGs or have commitments around SDGs or sustainable environmental activities is SDG 13 climate and SDG five gender. I mean, could there be a more perfect thing for them to possibly look at than W plus and all of these great environmental activities? I think not. And I am extremely passionate as you can tell from my voice and, and from being on this call that aligned with what Hannah said, more women have got to step up in this space because coming from investment banking and trading, I can tell you that what happens is as soon as a market starts to take off and there's real money behind it, men step in and they get into a position, and this is not a uniform statement, but I'm just generalizing here. They get into this, to this position that they know everything and they're right and they have the right to play in this space. And a lot of the women who may have been a huge part in helping uh, the market to even get to that point, feel overwhelmed and that that's not really their place. Um, or, or they silo themselves into a certain aspect of things when they could play a much bigger role. <clears throat> so I'm so excited to uh, learn about Hannah's project and connect with all of you and encourage each other to take these next steps together to really make the W plus market truly a women-led market. Um, I would just want to close uh, by saying that um, I can't do it alone. So I have a lot of enthusiasm. I have a lot of energy for this and I am funding this myself. However, uh, your support with creating awareness around this, your support with any project developers you know who might have an interest in this, getting in touch with Jeanette and myself is hugely appreciated. In order for me to go out and build the market, I need supply. And that supply we can create together. That supply is important. That supply has much bigger implications than just a measurable unit in an area of women's empowerment. This is about having cultural shifts at a larger scale. And I believe the ripple effects of what can come out of these W plus projects is greater than anything we can even anticipate on this call right now when we reflect back on this in a decade from now. So thank you for your time. Please feel free to email me, rachel at empowerco.com. Put your name and email on our website, empowerco.com. And I look forward to sharing uh, the launch with you all early next year. Thank you so, so much, Rachel. Um, uh, she's fearless, you can tell. And um, I think, can, can you all now see how critical and strategic it is to have somebody like Rachel setting up a brokerage agency so that people like Hannah who are doing project development and others have access to, to new markets and new sources of finance. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, we're at, we have about 28 minutes left. We wanna leave enough time for questions, but Shintal, it's all yours. You have a, you're gonna help us close this um, with a very a critical aspect about funding and initiatives like that. Thanks so much, Janad. Um, <laughs> And thanks also for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, what an incredible 
um, certainly it's been, I mean, I, I like Sue, I've just been immersed in listening to all of these amazing women speak. Um, so look, I'm going to try and keep mine, uh, my piece like quite short and, and then I'm happy to perhaps take some questions. Um, maybe a, a quick uh, introduction to myself. So I, I'm, I'm Chantal Barrot. For the purposes of this call, what I'll do is talk about the two hats that I wear. And so I sometimes forget that I too am a female entrepreneur and I've been running my own consultancy for well over 10 years. And it's only when I've been listening to the, the women on the call that I think, oh yeah, I should remind myself that I too am an entrepreneur, uh, rather than launch straight into talking about my clients and the work that I do. Um, but yeah, I think what I'll do is talk about the two hats I wear. The, the first of which is as a strategic advisor to the 2X Collaborative. I think a number of people are aware of the collaborative on the call, but just for those that perhaps aren't as familiar with it, this is the group of DFIs and MDBs that started working together um, over the last sort of three or four years to say, we are all as a group of development financiers interested in moving the needle on gender smart investing. Let's not all do this individually by ourselves. Let's collaborate. Um, to the point that the speaker made, one of the speakers made um, about women being natural collaborators, putting it into practice. And so the group said, let's really work together to move the needle. There is just simply no point in us trying to do all of this stuff individually. And so the 2X Collaborative was born out of that sentiment. I've been personally involved with it, um, with others in the field and, and some of those that run the Gender Smarts, uh, uh, platform, which I think a number of you are plugged into. And what we did was we created that initiative, we created a platform where all the DFIs and MDVs would collaborate together and say, this is where we are and this is what we need. And that has now uh, evolved. And now it's sort of three or four years down the line, you know, that platform is growing much bigger from the DFI and the, the MDB community to commercial banks and pension funds coming on board. Um, in the next round. So it's actually a much bigger platform for mainstreaming gender smart um, in the investment world. The collaborative has, the way it's structured is it has a couple of working groups. One is called the Investment Officer Working Group. Um, and that group is a group that I've been involved in quite heavily. Uh, it's an amazing group. I love working with them. Um, and they are the bankers on the front line who are really interested in saying, how can we mainstream gender in everything that we do, from sourcing of our deals, um, to structuring our deals, to adding value, uh, creating value for our clients. And so they're looking at the whole life cycle of this transaction. Oh, and by the way, going to our investment committees and saying why uh, this transaction should be approved because of the, the gender lens to it. So that's one working group. And then the second is the 2X Climate Finance Task Force. And this is something that I've been working on with Maria Elena, um, who seems to have her finger in lots of different pies. Uh, and she has really been amazing on the work of the Climate Finance Task Force. The IO working group was very focused and continues to be very focused on gender smart in transactions. The 2X Climate Finance Task Force has said, that's great, we, we need this work, but what we need to do is do gender smart climate finance. There's a clear connection there. At the moment, these areas are being looked at in silos within the uh, DFIs and MDB community, um, and we really just need to break down that silo. And so the group, work together to create um, a bunch of collateral, a bunch of guidance notes, and there's a toolkit, all of which are being launched at COP. And what that does is it puts into um, writing, I suppose, and clear guidance why investment officers should look at gender and climate together, one, how they can do that, um, two, and then three, lots of examples to support the why and the, sorry, the what, I missed the what, why, what, and the how. Um, the why, I think, is probably, I don't need to, you know, state it for, for this community, um, but for the agricultural sector, we really explain, um, you know, 
the nexus of, of the two areas, and particularly when it comes to ag, because we know of the large numbers of women that are in the agricultural sector, the fact that they're both vulnerable because of climate shocks in agriculture, but as, as the focus of this call is that they're also the, um, the solution providers almost. And so all of this to say that at least this group is really moving forward and really looking at ways to mainstream gender and climate in their transaction. And this is where I think the W plus standard and things like the W plus standard are, are going to be really interesting to the community, because so far, a lot of um, the sort of business case has been built on the publicly available information that we have, for example, through resources like the Financial Alliance for Women. And we've got lots of figures and data and stats about the female economy but what this does is it provides a very concrete and practical way um, for investment officers to work with their investees and their projects to say there's a could be a very clear monetary benefit um, to mainstreaming gender in you know in the transaction so that that for me i think is one new and two quite exciting um, area to explore the second is um, to talk about my second hat, which is as an advisor to the Rallying Cry Initiative. And the Rallying Cry Initiative um, was born out of a couple of things. One is that FMO as the sort of supporting founding um, uh, so, you know, investor um, said, look, we do want to do more in agribusiness. We, we really want to find and finance and support women entrepreneurs that are in agribusinesses and who are focusing on climate smart solutions like climate smart ag. But we don't know where they are. Where do we find them? And then when we do find them, we find we can't finance them because the ticket, our ticket sizes just don't allow for it. Our structure just doesn't allow for it. And so the Rallying Cry Initiative was born out of the, this desire to say, we want to find women on the front lines of climate change. The focus is on agribusiness to start with, but the idea is that it grows to other sectors because we hear the same thing about pipeline in other sectors. Um, the focus is on a couple of pilot countries, Kenya and Zambia at the moment. Um, there is something called the Women Business Leaders Forum, whereby we bring together a whole bunch of uh, women who are working in agribusiness, so that's entrepreneurs, to say what do you need what are your needs and if you were to ask uh for financing from the financing community what would that be um, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we are doing there um, and again i think that something like the w plus standard uh, would be really interesting and relevant for the women that we are working with so I'm going to stop there. Um, I've been really interested in hearing all of the speakers because I'm sensing that actually you have the pipeline. Our investors are saying, where's the pipeline? Uh, and so many of you are saying, we have the projects, we have the pipeline, and it would be amazing um, to build those bridges, as Hannah said. Thank you, Chantal. I think exactly what you said, the pipeline. We hear from people that there's not funding for great projects, and then we hear there's funding looking for projects. So it seems like the natural bridging um, that Hannah was also talking about. Okay, so that concludes all the speakers. We have now about another 20 minutes, um, but we can stay on for those of you who want to stay on, have time to do so. Um, and if there are questions and discussions yet to be held. Um, I have two questions in the chat, basically. Well, a few questions. Um, so I'll just jump in and any of you can uh, speakers can also respond to these. First one is from Vicky um, at Gates Foundation. Hi, Vicky, great to see you here. Um, asking about specific questions of the W plus standard that have been using used for projects related to both uh, carbon and um, women's empowerment. Um, there have been several and there are several in the pipelines as as uh, Rachel had also referred to. Um, these are mostly related to renewable energy and forestry to date, but there are others coming up that will also be dealing with water and sanitation um, and with um, things that are more related to agribusinesses. But um, in specific, there was a Nepal biogas project uh, that we won an award for in 2016 that measured time savings. Um, we also have um, forestry red project in Africa 
that um, has been supporting women's leadership that should soon be issuing credits. Um, we have even have green climate funded project starting up in Ghana that's gonna be focusing on shea production, which is traditionally that of women's involvement. Um, there's others doing water filtration, solar powered water filtration units in Africa, just, just to give a flavor of some, but there's a lot that are coming up in the pipeline as more and more are, are aware of, as Rachel said, the market demand for such a thing. Um, she's gonna be facing a su supply limitation. So that's a call out to project developers um, that we could use more projects like this. Um, also then there's some questions from, from Blaze about um, baseline for longstanding projects and compatibility with DCS and CCB. Um, I'll just answer these quickly, but the, the rest of you can also pop, pipe in if you'd like to. Um, Blaze, the W plus standard does allow for two years of back crediting. So even if it's been an ongoing project, we will gather data from the last two years and credit units to that period. Um, and as for compatibility, yes, you will see that we are aligned with the voluntary carbon standard. Um, and it is a label, as you mentioned, the CCB is a label for measuring biodiversity in a carbon project. The W plus is a label onto a carbon project similarly that measures um, co-benefits for women's empowerment. So we can also stack the W plus onto other carbon standards. Um, but since you mentioned, mentioned the VERA's uh, VCS and uh, CCB, um, does anybody else on uh, presenters want to jump in and answer any of those questions or any others? Okay, um, Vicki, yeah, we will share also, we will share both this slide deck as well as the recording. Um, there are about another hundred people who had registered to attend and many of them have written saying they're not able to attend it in live time and they want to hear it. So um, also, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna now, if there's no other key questions here and I've answered these, I would like to give some last um, chances to all of the speakers to specifically tell us um, strategically, um, you've all given great ideas about ways forward, but if you could just give one what would you see would be the way, the next action that we could do to scale up opportunities for women and climate entrepreneurs? Um, and I'll just go down the list. Maria, Elena, can you start? Maybe just one most strategic action. Yes, thank you, Jeanette. So from my side, I think certainly increasing awareness of generating women's empowerment units and stacking them to carbon credits and building the bridge, drawing the linkage between the two um, is, is critical. And building also the pipeline of women-led projects in this space and projects that could go through those processes, I think is critical. Okay, thank you. Katie, your one to two suggestions? Maria Laney, you stole mine. So I'll, I'll think of another one. Um, my second one is building the capacity, just the awareness of, of the importance of this nexus of climate and gender. And I mean, that exists in, on so many levels, the investor level, um, but also the consumer level. One of the, one of the questions in the chat was about you know, the, the awareness, the demand for these climate smart products. And the demand is really lacking because many Smallholder farmers, for example, don't understand the benefits of, of those types of products. The price point is too high, the, particularly for women um, smallholder farmers. So just creating that awareness and the support that women climate entrepreneurs need to help market their products. They have the idea, they have great innovations, but they don't necessarily know how to market them successfully, especially in the, this, this new, relatively new space. Good points. Okay, um, next is Hannah. Yeah, thanks. Um, building off uh, what Katie said, I, I super agree. Uh, women need to be supported who are doing these small initiatives, but typically these big funds, they have this sort of desire for scale and big and better and oh, you're too small. So it's just like, why is that too small? I like, <laughs> yeah, I'm small, but okay, you know. Uh, so I think investors need to change, you know, their investment criteria. 
uh, and look at women and these smaller investments. And yeah, it's, they just need to take a chance. And I think women need the tools to understand about methodologies because I think carbon projects is a huge way to finance impact. Um, and I think this tokenization, I'm learning a lot about blockchain and tokenization and NFTs. I think that could also have a big, um, uh, you know, opportunity in the future, tokenizing these, these impacts. So uh, just a lot more education about these different tools to finance and, and scale impact. And, and yeah, that, that's sort of my two cents. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Sue? Uh, oh god i mean so many things but I'll, I'll, I'll suggest one thing which is sort of relates specifically to the work that i'm doing on the task force and that would be to see co-benefits for women and other local communities and indigenous peoples incorporated into the core carbon principles because for me if it's integral, it's absolutely essential that all carbon credits have to have co-benefits, then it changes the game. It's game changing. Um, I know that's quite a big difference, but there we managed to get at least the question um, taken forward as a strategic question for the task force to consider in its next stage. So anyone who's in this space, again, <laughs> please use your platform to try and uh, take forward what I think is, is a really would be a, cru a crucial sort of, yeah, part of the, the puzzle. Perfect. Thank you. Rachel? So <clears throat> I believe where the money goes, more money flows. And so I would like to see that we are able to get some sizable initial deals done with the W plus credits that are available, those both individual and those that are labeled with carbon. I see that as the opportunity to inform uh, things like the carbon task force, um, investor committees uh, and project developers to be inspired to realize that this wave is already happening and they're either gonna get on board with it or they're not but we don't need to wait for anyone to give us permission to make this valid or right. We know it is, we have the data around it. And so now it's a matter of creating large scale demand. And so that we can um, fund all of these amazing projects and small female, small entrepreneurial networks of women that deserve to have this level of uh, funding available to them. Very good, thank you. Uh, Chintal. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, I think I'll just say, you know, for, for, from my perspective, that the most important thing for us is, is changing mindsets um, of all the investors we work with, the men and the women uh, investors. I mean, obviously, um, virtue of the field, we have a lot of, of male investors. And, and I must also say that for some of our working groups, we've had a couple of um, male uh, investment officers who have been amazing champions. And there's nothing like those champions for um, leading the charge for others to follow. Um, so you like the way that Hannah just summed it up um, about money flowing where you know more money will follow. And so what we, for me, what, what is really crucial is that we continue to change the mindsets of our investment officers by sharing with them just all of the voices on this call already would go a tremendous way to changing their mindsets into what's possible um, by just sharing with them that, wow, there's something like this W plus standard exists. It's a really great way to monetize gender smart investing um, already starts changing, you know, mindsets. Um, and one of the very sort of big things for us is peer to peer learning and collaboration. And if one DFI does this, then it has a ripple effect. Um, and all of the other DFIs or MDBs will look at that and say, oh, that's really great. Yeah, we're really interested. We want to do that as well. And so we keep that peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaboration at the heart of everything that we do. Yep, fantastic. Um, okay, I, these are all great suggestions. Also, I want to, uh, Rielena, can you put the last slide on that shows um, so please do feel free to connect with any of these wonderful women um, by their emails. Um, but I think these are fantastic um, suggestions. Also, Shintal mentioned she will be at the COP uh, in Glasgow. Uh, Sue and I will be there as well. 
And so I'm also, as I'm, as I'm thinking it way forward and how to share these incredible stories that all of you have said and, the, and Chintel following up on your advice about that, I'm thinking maybe we should do a podcast or something that would give enough time to have interviews with each of you because I think there are just not enough success stories and also not enough of the kind of personal stories like Hannah shared of what it's like to be a woman or, or Rachel shared, what it's like to be a woman in these sectors, um, the challenges they face. And I think I think that'd be a very popular podcast. So that's just um, what's in my idea right now. Um, would anyone else who's attending as a guest like to pipe in and say anything more before we close? Kayleen, if you're still on the call, can I ask you to say something? You, Kayleen's also one of these amazing women entrepreneurs um, in this climate space. Jeanette, I am here, but what do you want me to say? I'm just um, <laughs> grateful to be able to listen on a webinar and not um, present. No, so okay. I definitely follow up with a lot of you. This is super, super interesting. Um, and so just as a bit of background, I wear two hats. That sounds like almost everybody on this call wears two hats. So I have a gender lens uh, lending platform for SME uh, in Indonesia, focusing on women owned women led businesses. And to my knowledge, we're the first in Asia to also bring in a climate lens for our lending platform. And so we have some rudimentary metrics, but I'm trying to get better metrics and more rigor to be able to talk about specifically the impact. Then I also have a consulting firm and we're developing an offering for gender and climate. All of our clients are like, DFIs and the investment officers and the fund managers and the fund of funds managers. And they're asking specifically, how do they integrate gender into climate? So I've been, I've taken like three pages of notes today. So thank you, ladies. <laughs> Thanks, Kayleen. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to say anything? Okay, if not, we will definitely um, provide all this to you. Um, this has been fantastic for us. It's given us great food for thought and great food for the kind of collaboration discussions that Wokan is about to enter into in meetings in London next week, as well as at the COP. Um, I'm personally in four speaking events at the COP. So it's nice to have this behind me that I can uh, use as evidence of the way we understand the picture of women climate entrepreneurs there. Really looking forward as well to Katie's study, um, very rich and unique, uh, one of the first ones out there, I would say on this. And so thanks to Katie as well for the amazing connection she's made for us to others in this field. We're a small group um, so far. And I think um, this fits very closely into what Volkan's mission is, is to sort of form networks around these of women involved in these kind of sectors. So I think we will look forward to hearing more from us as well as we try to build a network perhaps linked as well to Katie's PFAN that she mentioned, um, but we will, we really appreciate you guys signing up to the call and staying on with us. Um, I'm also kind of blown away at this point about these stories, <laughs> which is why I wanted to find a way to delve into more detail about that. So stay tuned. Thank you all very much. Um, and we'll be reporting back to all of you and to everyone at the COP. Thanks again. And thanks very thanks, much everyone. to the presenters. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, this is Jeanette. awesome. Everyone. Okay. Go get him a cop, Jeanette. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.